Hi, this is Marlene, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Whether you're watching a video or listening to a podcast, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. Links to videos or MP3 files can be found on MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Go to MarlenePardo.com for information on new book releases. I narrate several podcast series that can be found on major podcast platforms and can also be listened to via Alexa, Sonos, and other home systems. Look for Supernatural Storytime for scary storytelling, Nightshade Diary for classic horror and adventure stories, Stories of the Supernatural for interviews with different guests on the show. If you want to get noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird, you can visit Strange Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com or find us on Blogspot. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and this episode of Stories of the Supernatural is brought to you by our sponsor, Primary Notary Services. They provide notary services at your convenience when you need it, where you need it, and they travel to your location at a time that is suitable for you in the entire state of Florida. They provide fast, friendly, reliable, and above all, professional solutions, always keeping your privacy in mind. Their services, of course, are mobile. They can assist you with immigration forms, virtual assistance services, title processing. They can officiate at your wedding. They also have remote online notary services. And what that means is that you can go ahead and complete whatever notary services you require over the computer. They also have bilingual staff that speak fluent English and Spanish and all their notaries are background check, certified, bonded, and insured. They're available seven days a week, after hours, weekends, and holidays. You can call them at 844-423-7773 or go to primarynotary.net. You can email them also at hello at primarynotary.net. Again, their phone number is 844-423-7773. The following stories are an excerpt from my book, Lady in the Blue Kimono, Film Noir Murders. And uh, I'm going ahead and releasing this episode because I'm about to go ahead and by September of 2021, Film Noir Murders Book 2, titled Hot Dame on a Cold Slab, will be available on my website, MarlenePardo.com, or you can go to Amazon and look for it on my author page, as Marlene Pardo Pelliser. All the following stories are true. And let's start off with the title of the book, which is called The Lady in the Blue Kimono. It was a hot summer day in 1937 when three boys were playing baseball on Orange Street in the exclusive Wilshire neighborhood of Los Angeles. One of the boys was 10-year-old Malcolm. And when the ball rolled under the four-apartment building where he lived, he was the one to volunteer to go under the structure and retrieve the ball. The playtime came to a sudden stop when Malcolm exited pale, perspiring, and screaming in terror that there was someone underneath the home. When the police arrived, they were faced with a bizarre mystery. According to the El Paso Herald Post, what was found was the badly decomposed body of a middle-aged, red-haired woman laying face up next to what appeared to be a crudely dug grave. There was a second shallow grave 30 feet away. The Harrisburg Telegraph reported that it was estimated she had been dead for about two months. She had been shot through the cheek, but there was also evidence she had been raped or outrage, which was the term used by the newspapers of the day. Dressed in a blue silk kimono, she had a house slipper that matched the color of her robe on her left foot that corresponded to the right foot. The other slipper lay a few feet away. Underneath the body was her slip. Her negligee had been pulled up to her hips, exposing her legs. The only clue to her identity was a wedding ring on her finger with the inscription, Hal to Alice, August 31, 1919. The ground floor of the apartment building 
had been vacant until only recently. A neighbor named Mrs. Myers, who was an invalid and lived on the second floor, told the police about something she heard two months before. She related how she had been awakened by hearing someone crying out and then a car horn blaring for several minutes from a vacant lot next to the building. Then she heard a strangled scream of murder, murder, murder. Mrs. Myers became so alarmed that she awoke the nurse that stayed with her and sent her downstairs to investigate. When the nurse arrived on the ground floor, the noises abruptly ceased and she saw an automobile speed away. They called the police and then went back to bed thinking that it was neighbors who were intoxicated. They never heard anything else about it until the discovery was made of the woman's body. When the police questioned the neighbors, none of them could recall seeing anyone matching the woman's description, nor was there any missing persons report that corresponded to her. The police believed the body was dragged under the building through a lattice ventilator that faced the vacant lot. The mystery of who this woman was appeared to be solved a few days later. Harold Jones, the wealthy president of an optical company, identified the gold wedding band taken from the woman's body. F. E. Manning from Burbank also identified the ring as one that his sister Alice wore. Due to the state of decomposition, Mr. Jones viewed the clothing found on the corpse as well. He confirmed they belonged to his wife. Mr. Jones said his wife suffered from a mental ailment and had disappeared from his home only a few months before in October 1936. She was found three days later at which time he placed her in a rest home which she disappeared from on December 14, 1936. It was five miles away from where Alice's mummified remains were found. The unanswered question was where was this woman between December 1936 and April of 1937 when it was estimated she had died. Her clothing was described as expensive so she was not living on the streets or in a hovel. It is strange no one reported a woman wearing a blue kimono wandering the streets of Los Angeles for whatever time it took her to cover the five miles between where she was found and where she had escaped from. Strangely enough, according to information her husband provided to the newspapers, this was only the second time she had disappeared. The first time had been for a short period of time. The emphasis had been in the later newspaper articles that due to her mental illness she had run away and stayed underneath the building without seeking to eat food or drink water. What about the two holes dug near to the body? Had the arrival of Mrs. Meyer's nurse interfered with a plan to bury the body? Whom was the second grave for? Had this location been selected on purpose since there was no one living on the ground floor, no witnesses, or anyone to complain about smells coming from putrefying remains. Digging two, let alone one hole, which was described as one foot deep and five feet in length, must have been dirty and time-consuming work, which indicated there was a specific purpose for having dug them. Did the perpetrators fear the police had been called when the nurse went downstairs? Perhaps they were forced to flee before they had a chance to bury the body. It was evident the killer or killers were familiar with this area and where a body could be stashed. One has to consider the possibility that the two graves had been dug not for Alice but for Mrs. Myers and her nurse. It wouldn't be the first time that witnesses are killed in order to tie up loose ends. On June 23, 1937, the newspapers reported that Alice Jones, 42, who suffered from a mental illness which caused her to hide had crawled under the apartment building where she died from exposure and hunger. The examining physician then reported that the mark on her cheek was not from a bullet but from the decomposition of the body. This story was completely opposite to the story reported by various newspapers describing where the victim had died violently and that a neighbor heard a disturbance next to the building around the time it was estimated she had been killed. Once the corpse was identified, is when the story about the state of her body and how she had come to die changed. What was the truth of the circumstances involving Alice's death? She certainly couldn't clarify it and her husband passed away in 1950. Only 10 years later, in a scant six miles away, 
the mutilated body of Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, was found at Limert Park. Honeymoon of Death It was early November 1939 and 18-year-old Carolyn Havey made her vows as the leaves were turning golden red, unaware that she would not live to see the coming holidays or the new year of 1940. She moved into a new apartment in Springfield, Massachusetts with her 20-year-old husband, Walter Hibbard, and one has to wonder if she had any idea that she had married a monster. Eight days after he became a married man, Walter bought a train ticket to go to Montreal, but he got off at Battleboro, Vermont. That was about 40 miles from Springfield. He approached a policeman who possibly anticipated inquiries to an address or some other innocuous conversation. Anything but what he heard, which was, I killed my wife in Springfield. He explained that it occurred during one of his periodic urges to kill he suffered from. The officer wasted no time in contacting the Springfield police who busted down the apartment door and found out just how understated the perpetrator's comment was in comparison to the horror that was found in the bathroom. In the bathtub, filled with blood and water, was Caroline's decapitated body. In a nearby basin was her head, and a hunting knife was on the floor. The medical examiner later determined that Caroline had been stabbed five times in the chest while she lay in bed, and her death had occurred when her heart and lungs were punctured. He apparently dragged her to the bathroom, disrobed her from the wrapper she was wearing, and sawed her head off her torso. He then proceeded to put her inside the tub. It was concluded there had been premeditation on Walter's part since he bought the hunting knife only the day before. When the killer was asked why he traveled to Battleboro to make a confession, he said that he was afraid the Springfield police would make him look at his wife's body. The detectives searched the apartment, and the most hardened of them had to turn away when they found the bridal bouquet still fresh inside the refrigerator. Walter Hibbard did not resist extradition back to Springfield, and he told reporters he had his first urge to kill two years before, but this had been his first opportunity to make it a reality. He said the night of her death, his young wife asked him to bring her a glass of water to the bed where she was laying. Instead, he came with a knife, where he proceeded to stab her once through the chest. He said she cried out a little, and then lay still. Walter appeared to have a history for violence, as he attacked his own sister seven years before with a claw hammer when he was 13 years old, and she was seven years old. Brain doctors examined him at that time and said it was an isolated incident. Caroline was buried in the family's plot in Shardburn Cemetery in Maine, next to her sister, Mary Elise, who had died when she was seven years old the same year Caroline was born. The occasion was even sadder, since it was a certain that Caroline had been pregnant when she was killed. Walter appeared before the judge and pled not guilty. He also told the court that he was under psychiatric care and the judge ordered a mental examination for him. The judge also thought it was prudent not to grant him bail. After the flurry of newspaper stories about the horrific murder, the stories petered out and it appears that at least in 1940, he was a patient at the State Hospital for Mental Diseases in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. What occurred in the years following 1940 is unknown, except that he did marry again became a widower when he was 82 years old and tied the knot for the third time and then died when he was 90 years old in 2009. Whether his wives ever knew of what happened to Caroline remains a mystery. But no doubt, if they did, they learned how to sleep with one eye open and never to ask him for a glass of water. The Curse of the Blue Kimono the Chicago streets were slick with ice, and Frank Robinson, a local junk man, made his way through a south side alley off Wentworth Avenue and 35th Street. It was January 5, 1940, and his wife Helen told him she had seen what looked like a steamer trunk behind their home as she walked back from an early morning visit to the bakery. He guessed that it was something discarded from the Christmas season and he wanted to get to it before anyone else did. When he approached it, he saw the trunk appeared cheaply made, 
but seemed to be new. It was dark green with black metal and brass bands. He grabbed it and was surprised at how heavy it was. He fought to drag it into his yard. He realized he would need to empty it out to get it up the stairs into the home. He battered the lock off, expecting it to be filled with old clothes and shoes, anything. But what actually popped out once he pried open the lid. It was a human foot inside a black shoe. His eyes widened as he looked down into the shallow depth of the trunk and saw that it was the frozen, battered body of a frail woman that had been wedged in, her knees pulled up to her chest. Officer Johnson was the first at the scene. He observed the woman was dressed in a black crepe dress, white underskirt, black shoes, silk stockings, and a brown coat. She wore a cheap fur cap in contrast to the well-made outfit that was now frozen to the skin of her body. Her head, wrapped in a blue kimono, was smeared with blood. Both of her eyes were deeply bruised, and there was a scalp wound near the left temple, which he believed at that time had been made by a bullet. Once the blood had been cleaned away, it was found. She had freshly permed gray hair, and she appeared to be between 50 to 60 years of age. Dr. Levinson, the coroner's physician, confirmed that both of her legs had been broken between the hip and the knee when they were being forced into the trunk. She received a savage beating that left her with her skull fractured in three places. He believed that a hammer had been used to cause the injuries. She had two round indentations on each temple, indicating that she was hit twice on each side of her head. She had five broken ribs on her right side that had probably occurred when the body was wedged into the small space. The doctor estimated that she had been deceased approximately eight hours, and it was unknown if she was already dead when placed in the trunk or if she had been alive and died from her injuries and the freezing weather. None of the neighbors in the area said they had heard any commotion during the night. The police speculated that the trunk had been left during the early morning hours before dawn. The cold weather kept people indoors, so it was not surprising that there were no witnesses to offer any clues for them to follow. The killer took the precaution of dumping her far from where anyone could identify her. It was during this time that a woman calling herself Cleota DeLeo came to the station to place a missing persons report for her mother. She was shown the clothing the victim had been wearing, and she confirmed they belonged to her mother. She told police her mother's name was Nellie Sharp. She was 65 years old and had been a maid at the Belmont Hotel on the north side for 12 years. The police first looked at the victim's estranged husband, 65-year-old John Sharp. He told police the couple had married in 1911 and then moved to Chicago in 1916. As the police were delving into Mrs. Sharp's background, they received an unexpected call from the Belmont Hotel where she worked at. They told the police that a woman with faded blonde hair who claimed to be Nellie's daughter had come by to pick up her wages. A stocky, powerfully built man accompanied her. The police asked at what time they had come by. The police then realized this was prior to the couple's visit to the police station. The police now had suspects that were much closer to home than they originally thought. The police immediately went to the flat on West 25th Street that Mrs. Sharp shared with her daughter and son-in-law. They found bloodstains that led them to believe they had found the murder scene. The couple was taken back to the police station. They interviewed each separately, starting with 49-year-old Sam DeLeo, who confessed, after eight hours of questioning, that he killed Nellie Sharp. Cleota, 36, who claimed she was not in the house when the murder occurred, said she had gone for a walk in the evening, and when she returned, expecting that her mother had come home from work, asked her husband if he had seen her. He enigmatically said, You won't be seeing her anymore. The couple lived with Mrs. Sharp, who was the only one employed. Samuel had lost his job with the WPA during the summer of 1939. According to the killer, the old lady nagged me all the time because I didn't have a job. I hit her on the head with a hammer. Nellie Sharp was less than five feet tall and weighed only 125 pounds. She was unable to defend herself after the first blow. He told police, 
The murder had occurred about 6 a.m. when Mrs. Sharp was preparing to go to work, and they had started to argue, one of many times, when she would tell him she was tired of supporting the household. He was a strongly built man, and once he had killed her, he had taken the body and with brute strength stuffed it into a trunk the victim owned. He stashed it away until the evening when he made plans to dispose of it. He told his neighbor, Natalie Pintaro, who was a vegetable peddler, that he needed his help to get rid of the trunk. The neighbor took it in his truck and left it in the alley. The neighbor claimed he had no idea of the grisly contents of the trunk. Samuel's story differed from the version Cleota told the police. He told police that Cleota had been in the front room of the house and ran to the back when she heard the scuffle and hit him and told him to stop. Cleota insisted she had not been in the house at all during the attack. Under further questioning, she amended her story, stating that she left the house to walk the dog after her mother and husband started to quarrel. Upon returning, she found her husband mopping the floor and telling her she wouldn't be seeing her mother anymore. This was not the only part of her story that started to unravel. It turns out that she was not married to Samuel DeLeo after all. No doubt, this did little to help her credibility. On January 8, 1940, Helen Nellie Dunn Sharp was buried in the family plot in Dodge Grove Cemetery in Champaign, Illinois. Four days later, a coroner's jury recommended that Cleo Pallas, as she was referred to now in the local Chicago newspapers, and Sam DeLeo be held to the grand jury for the murder of Mrs. Sharp. In her last testimony, Cleo said that when she returned to the home, she had found her mother already dead and that Sam threatened her own life if she did not keep quiet. He had refused to testify against her, but insisted that she was lying and that she had nagged him for a year and a half to kill her mother in order to collect a $500 life insurance. He said that in the end, he had just lost his temper with the old woman and had beaten her with a weighted end of a sawed-off billiard cue. On April 4th, Sam DeLeo was sentenced to 199 years after withdrawing an insanity plea. On May 1st, the newspapers reported how Cleo Pallas, on the day of the trial, right before it was about to begin, requested a bench trial, rather than face the eight women who were part of the jury. The judge declared her guilty and sentenced her to 14 years in the Dwight Penitentiary for Women. She went on to remarry and died in 1985. Sam DeLeo served his sentence until March 17, 1962, when at the age of 72, he died inside prison from a long illness. He was interred in the Southern Illinois Penitentiary Cemetery. Ladies of the Lake There's nothing that ends a lazy day of bass fishing like finding a body, and not only a body, but the mutilated body of a woman which left no doubt that it was not a suicide. Within 24 hours, any hope that there was only one victim came to an undeniable end. When troopers who were searching the shoreline of the Lake of the Ozarks, where the first body had been found, came upon a second murdered woman only 200 yards away. The local newspapers didn't even have time to publicize the discovery of the first body, and on April 17, 1944, the headlines trumpeted about the second body found in the glazed arm of the Lake of the Ozarks. Sheriff Jack Stotler described where the first body appeared to have had a sharp knife or hatchet used to hack the woman's head off above her mouth. The left leg was severed between the knee and the hip. At that time, neither the head nor the leg had been found. The body was nude except for one stocking and a fragment of undergarment. When the three anglers found her, she had been in the water for about one week. She had a stocky build, black hair, and appeared to be about 45 years old. The second body found was that of a younger woman in her 20s. The head and one breast had been hacked off and the body mutilated. Both bodies were found near Highway 54 in a wooded resort area with camp cabins nearby. Bloodstained clothing was the next discovery law enforcement came upon near the water's edge. The sheriff surmised that the bodies were dumped from a boat as no footprints or any evidence was found on the ground 
around the shoreline where the bodies ended up. The authorities believe that due to rainy weather in the days preceding the discovery and the cold temperature of the water, decomposition of the corpses had not been as rapid. As the investigation progressed, law enforcement was able to verify more information. It appeared that both women had died the previous Saturday night and the younger one had been shot at close range three times with a shotgun, once under each arm and then in the back. The killer had left a ring she wore on the third finger of her left hand. A couple who lived nearby reported hearing three shots that sounded like they had come from a shotgun around 7 p.m. on that day. But in the days to come it was found that they had originated from hunters that were in the area. There were no reports of women missing that fit their description, and the only clue that helped the sheriff was a discovery that the material the younger one was wearing was something called feed sack, popular in the hill country. The next clue came from a camp proprietor who said he had seen a cruiser on the lake about six miles above the dam. These types of boat were not used during this time of year, and an inspection of boathouses in the area yielded no results. As the days progressed, and more information came from the coroner's office and the University of Missouri medical offices, the theories as to the method of murder and the possible identity of the murderers changed. The age and weight of both women had increased, and it appears they had rope marks on their body, leading to the belief they were bound together. The older woman was estimated to weigh in excess of 200 pounds, leading to the suspicion that there had been more than one person involved in dumping the bodies, which were now believed to have been dragged to the shoreline and not thrown from a boat. The older woman also had evidence of being killed with a shotgun. Over 170 number four buckshot were removed from her body, mostly in the upper torso, lending suspicion that she had been shot in the head before it was removed. They had taken 250 shots from the younger one. The younger woman had not born a child and neither had been raped. A month later, the identity of the woman remained a mystery and circulars with her description were distributed to all police agencies in Missouri and the surrounding states. In the meantime, both bodies were being preserved in alcohol at the University of Missouri at Columbia. It was not until mid-May that a connection was made between two women, a mother and daughter, who had been reported missing since the beginning of April. They lived in Lamont, Missouri, and their names were Pearl Fairfax, age 59, and Molly Maddie Rose Holland, age 36. It was Pearl's stepson, Jesse Fairfax, who contacted police since he had not heard from her in a long time. This was not like her, and he suspected foul play. The police immediately visited the address provided by Jesse Fairfax. They spoke to Edgar Holland, Molly's husband, who said he had not reported his wife or his mother-in-law missing since he believed they were each visiting family in different states. He told police that Mrs. Fairfax regularly visited family in Florida and Texas. Only this past summer, his wife had spent several weeks away from home, not even bothering to tell him where she was staying. Mr. Holland insisted to police that the bodies did not belong to Molly or Pearl and that they would be found alive and well. The police were confident they knew the identity of the victims, but without Holland's cooperation, they needed proof that was more concrete. No doubt, the bodies had been mutilated in order to make it difficult, if not impossible, to know who these women were. A Sedalia practical nurse who attended Mrs. Fairfax several years before when she had undergone an operation for gallstones, made the first tentative identification of the bodies. They had been friends for over 20 years. After viewing the body, she stated that the scar on the body matched Mrs. Fairfax's, as well as the fact that she was missing the nail from the big toe of one of her feet. Jesse Fairfax then described that Mrs. Fairfax was a dressmaker, known to make garments from a type of feed sacks just as the one found close to the bodies. He also said that she had an open sore on her left leg, which was the one removed from the body. Upon further investigation, the Hollands' marriage appeared to be a troubled one. They had separated several times only to reconcile, and during the fall of the previous year, 
Molly Holland, had filed suit for divorce and then withdrew it a few weeks later. In an effort to confirm the identity of the younger victim, they went to see Bill Dunlop, who Mrs. Holland had been married to for seven years. They had divorced in 1937. Molly had married Edgar Holland, July 1940. After speaking to several neighbors and family members of both women, there was a consensus that neither of them had been seen after April 1st. In 1928, after robbing the Bank of Lamont, Edgar Holland received a 35-year sentence in the state penitentiary. He was paroled in 1935. It wasn't only Edgar Holland's criminal past or the fact that he had not reported his wife missing that made police suspicious. It was found he had replaced the flooring on the farm home where he lived. He also repapered the kitchen and replaced the door, which was not even there when the workers arrived. The police interviewed the carpenters who did the work, and they all said there was nothing unusual about the floor. But prior to their arrival, Edgar Holland had removed all the wallpaper and the kitchen door, which he also wanted to replace. Mr. Holland also burnt most of the discarded wood and paper out in the yard of the farm. The owner of Wilson's Hill Summer Resort, which sat on the Lake of the Ozarks, confirmed that the Hollands have frequently stayed there during the last seven years. This resort was less than a mile from where the bodies were found. Ultimately, a fingerprint lifted from a gin bottle found at the home confirmed Maddie Holland's identity. Review of the divorce suit filed by Mrs. Holland cited the reasons as that he, Mr. Holland, had beaten her brutally and had threatened her life on several occasions. On May 20th, Edgar Holland was arrested after human bloodstains were found on the stove and two of the chairs. He was charged initially only with the murder of his wife and not his mother-in-law. On May 25th, Pearl Fairfax was buried. The coroner had not released her daughter's body as it was being used as evidence in the murder trial. Leo J. Harnid was a prosecuting attorney for Pettis County. The witnesses brought to testify at the preliminary hearing on July 1st painted a grim picture about Edgar Holland, despite his insistence that he was innocent. J.R. Shane testified that three weeks before the women had been killed, Edgar Holland had commented to him that he felt like getting a shotgun, shooting them, cutting their heads off, and throwing them in the river. Edgar said he was tired that both women were always gone from the house. Dr. Powers and Dr. Dyer, who had been brought in to identify the bodies as they had attended both women in the past as patients, testified that Edgar Holland had offered $500 to each of them to get me out of this. In the end, 36 witnesses testified at the hearing. Holland paid for the $15,000 bond set by the judge. He also had several of his neighbors and relatives sign it as guarantors. Fred F. Westner was a defense attorney, and the trial was set for October 23, 1944. On October 11th, Molly Holland's body was interred in the Otterville Cemetery where her mother had been buried. The trial was reset for January 1945 and once more for February 3rd. Holland's defense insisted that he had no motive to kill either woman. Testimony presented by a witness, Mrs. Gregory, refuted this. She said Mrs. Holland made the following statement during a conversation they shared, referring to her husband. The SOB found me this time, but the next time I leave him, he won't find me. It was apparent there was no love lost between the couple. It did not take long for the ten-man jury to find Edgar Holland guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment. He was charged with the murder of Mrs. Fairfax before the month was out, but he never stood trial for it. The missing body parts for Molly and Mrs. Fairfax were never recovered. His sentence of life imprisonment was upheld by the state Supreme Court and in January 1950 he was denied a new hearing. In April 1965, Edgar Holland asked for a new trial, claiming his rights were violated during the original proceedings. On March 13, 1967, he lost his appeal for a new trial. A month later, he filed a petition for habeas corpus in federal district court after granting him three evidentiary hearings, they denied relief on March 11, 1970. Edgar Holland died in 1978, still serving his sentence.